Christmas tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good evening, it's nine o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, a Labour government is coming and I haven't met anyone that's looking forward to it. My Mark Meets guest is the world-renowned biographer of King Charles, who will give us the inside story of our remarkable monarch's short but challenging reign. In the big story, after a shock poll of local Tory councillors, are the Conservatives now too left-wing? I'll be speaking to Philip Davies MP, who strongly disagrees, and makes the case for Sunak being the most Conservative PM since Margaret Thatcher. And looking forward to this in my take at 10, Angela Rayner and the political scandal that won't go away. I'll be dealing with Labour's deputy leader in no uncertain terms at 10. You won't want to miss it. A really busy and lively show to come. Two hours of big opinion, big debate and big entertainment. Get the kettle on and I'll see you after the headlines with Tatiana Sanchez. Mark, thank you very much and good evening. The top stories this hour. Thousands of Israelis are gathering in Jerusalem calling for the release of hostages still being held by the Hamas terror group. In Tel Aviv tonight, candles have been lit in vigils for the hostages. It comes as today marks six months since the terror attack on October 7th. Families of hostages also joined a rally in London to call for their release, saying the six months after the attack have been hell. Marking the occasion, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has said the government continues to stand by Israel's right to defend its security. And he added the UK is shocked by the bloodshed and called for an immediate humanitarian pause in fighting. He also urged Hamas to release its hostages and implored Israel to get aid into Gaza more swiftly. Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary has used the occasion to stress that the UK's support for Israel is not unconditional. Writing in the Sunday Times, Lord Cameron said there's no doubt where the blame lies over the death of three British aid workers. And he added, this must never happen again. John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby died in airstrikes carried out by the IDF on an aid convoy on the 1st of April. The Deputy Prime Minister has denied claims the UK is failing to prepare for war. Oliver Dowden is defending the government after outgoing Armed Forces Minister James Heapy told The Telegraph only ministers of the defence officials attended a wartime preparation exercise which was meant for the whole of government. Former Defence Secretary Ben Wallace has backed him up, saying too many in government are just hoping everything goes away. 
Police have named a man they're searching for after a woman was stabbed to death in broad daylight in Bradford city centre. West Yorkshire police detectives say they want to trace 25-year-old Habiba Masoom, who's from the Oldham area. They were called to the city centre yesterday afternoon following reports of an attack by a man who fled the scene. The woman was taken to hospital where she later died. And former Tottenham defender and Wimbledon football manager Joe Kinnear has died at the age of 77. Dublin-born Kinnear, who also managed Newcastle, Nottingham Forest and Luton, had been suffering from dementia, having been diagnosed in 2015. He won the FA Cup, the League Cup and the UEFA Cup as a player with Spurs. His family says he died peacefully this afternoon. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's over to Mark. Thanks, Tatiana. Welcome to a very busy Mark Dolan tonight. In the big story, after a shock poll of local Tory councillors, are the Conservatives now too left-wing? My Mark Meets guest is the world-renowned biographer of King Charles, who will give us the inside story of our remarkable monarch's short but challenging reign. And in my take at 10, Angela Rayner and the political scandal that won't go away. I'll be dealing with Labour's deputy leader in no uncertain terms at 10. You won't want to miss it. Plus, tomorrow's front page is at 10.30 with three top pundits who haven't been told what to say and who don't follow the script. Tonight, former advisor to Boris Johnson, Lord Coolvia Ranger, journalist and communications advisor, Linda Jubilee, and author and campaigner for children in care, Chris Wilde. And tonight I'll be asking the pundits, six months on, has Israel gone too far in its response to October the 7th? Plus, the most important part of the show, your emails, they come straight to my laptop, mark at gbnews.com. And this show has a golden rule. We don't do boring, not on my watch. I just won't have it. So, a big two hours to come, lots to get through. Angela Rayner at 10, but first, my big opinion. Have you ever known such a lack of enthusiasm for an incoming government? In 1979, fed-up Brits ushered in the arrival of Margaret Thatcher with a sense of hope and optimism off the back of five years of union chaos, economic crisis, inflation, unemployment and the so-called winter of discontent, during which there were regular blackouts, piles of rubbish lying uncollected in the street and dead bodies unburied. Similarly, after the exchange rate mechanism crisis under John Major, and with a Conservative Party dogged by allegations of sleaze, Tony Blair's landslide victory in 1997 felt like a new chapter for the country. I voted for Blair three times. Of course, they made mistakes, huge mistakes, particularly unchecked mass immigration. But like under Thatcher, those Blair administrations were based on sensible levels of taxation, law and order, education, a well-funded NHS, aspirations, social mobility, a powerful city of London, a booming services sector and solid economic growth. And both Thatcher and Blair won three back-to-back -back victories and that did not happen by mistake. Well, as we sit here 14 years after David Cameron's 2010 victory at the fag end of a Tory government, you would expect a clamour for change and a jubilant excitement at the idea of Prime Minister Keir Starmer. But it's not there. Of course it's not. Have you ever met a Keir Starmer fan? Finding one is harder than playing a game of Where's Wally? And I'm not even sure that there's much of an appetite for Labour's policy agenda either. Do the public really want more net zero, an expensive experiment which bets the house on flaky renewables and which threatens our economy, way of life and energy security? Remember, Starmer was against Sunak's decision to grant new gas licences in the North Sea, even though in this unstable world where energy costs are through the roof, it makes perfect sense to tap into our own resources. The Americans have done that with shale gas and they have enjoyed high economic growth, low energy costs and lower inflation. 
Do the public really want more strikes? Are you seriously telling me that Labour will be tougher with the union's wage-busting, inflation-busting demands, given that the self-same unions fund the Labour Party? Does anyone seriously think that Labour will be more successful than the Tories in stopping illegal immigration into the country, which is costing taxpayers £7 million a day and destabilising communities? Sir Keir is on record as saying that he would axe the Rwanda plan, and I quote, even if it works. That's right, he would axe Rwanda even if it works. If that's not naked politics, I don't know what is. Do the public want more wokery in our public institutions, with the NHS calling women birthing humans and chest feeders? Do they want schools, universities and museums characterising Britain's past as shameful? Do they want more primary schools transitioning children without the knowledge of their parents? A shocking story that I dealt with on yesterday's show. Do the public really want five years of an even bigger state? in a country that quite simply lives beyond its means, with the highest taxes since the Second World War. Taxes which are surely only going to go up if Sir Keir is to fulfil his supporters' clamour for more so-called investment in public services. Investment, by the way, translates as more borrowed billions. Do the public really want an administration that hates Brexit? Former Labour Foreign Secretary David Miliband, writing in The Observer today, says that Brexit has made the UK a lower-status nation. That's what they think of this place and the choice of 17.4 million people to leave a political bloc overseas. Is Sir Keir, the man who sought to reverse Brexit, really the man to tap into its many opportunities? I won't hold my breath. Do the public want a Prime Minister in Sir Keir Starmer who's got more flip-flops than a flagship branch of Sports Direct? A man who struggles to define what a woman is, who takes the knee to the latest woke cause, changes his mind about everything, and a man who, if he'd been in power, would have pursued the insane and, in my view, failed policy of lockdowns with even more vigour. The Tories have been a disaster in recent years and have torched their reputation for sound government. I get it. Which means a Labour government is coming, but I don't know anyone that's celebrating. Now, Labour supporters would argue that the Tories have presided over these high levels of illegal and legal net migration. They would argue that the Tories tanked the economy, caused mortgage rates to go sky high, that it's the Tories who have presided over union chaos and that they would tackle these issues in government. Labour would argue that the opinion polls demonstrate that Britain isn't just ready but wants change. Uh, let's get your thoughts. Mark at gbnews.com. I'll get to your emails shortly. But first, my top pundits this evening. Former advisor to Boris Johnson, Lord Corvier Ranger. Journalist and communications advisor, Linda Jubilee. And last but not least, campaigner for children in care and broadcaster and author, the one and only... Chris Wilde. Well, folks, uh, let's uh, sink our teeth into uh, yes. what you've got to say about this. Uh, Linda, let me start with you. I don't know anyone that's looking forward to this Labour government. No, it's true that there's no real excitement about it, although I have heard, including on, on the radio on the way in tonight, several people who were fans of Keir Starmer. Now, I do admit he's not charismatic, um, but the more important point is he doesn't resonate. And that is, that's very difficult for people to understand. Most British people in this country <clears throat> don't pay attention to the detail of politics, so they need a character that resonates, and Keir Starmer doesn't. And the problem is that perception has become reality. We see him as dull and, uh, dull and wooden, and now he really has become dull and wooden, and people don't really get behind him. But they do not want the Tories in again. I'm out on the ground the whole time in three constituencies where I live, listening to people, and there's no question about who they're going to be voting for in the, in the local May elections. Chris Wilde. Yes, absolutely. I think at the moment, for me, We've got two parties, like two really good football teams with no quality strikers, and I think that's for me. That's, and when you're out in the community as well, that's the feedback from people, real people in the community. They're not going to vote the Tories. They know it's a Labour government, but I, I think regardless of, of anything else, 
that in the community, people are struggling, people are starving. They want this change, they need this change, and it's going to come with a Labour Party. But we'd be much better off, wouldn't we, with five but, years of, of uh, Rishi Sunak, wouldn't you say? No, I, I, well, look what's happened so far. The, the Tory party don't even know themselves. They don't know themselves at all. And look what's happened. If, you, if you're out in the community, Mark, talking to real people, the Tories have destroyed people. They, people are living on the streets because of what the Tories have done. So do you feel that Labour are the answer? Will they do a but, better but job? But what's, what's the alternative? The Green Party, the Liberal Democrats? The only people who can deliver this, can deliver a good Monday is the Labour Party and I will agree with you I'm not a big fan of Keir Starmer but who else have we got who else has the Labour Party got right now are you Labour looking country? forward to a Labour government your concerns yeah. about Starmer's personality aside are you looking forward? I, are you relishing five years I am, of Labour I am I am Mark because I'm I'm a real person I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a journalist I'm not a politician I'm a real person in the community and I see I see the damage and I see where we need to build the communities once more and Labour can do that uh, you're just grimacing there before I come to Colvia Ranger, Linda Jubilee. Yeah, I think that people undeniably want to change. They really, really do, and that's what's going to happen. And we'll see a big indication of what's likely to happen in November mm. on May the 2nd. We need to pay very close attention to what's going to happen there. Colvia, change for change's sake, I'd rather have five more years of Rishi Sunak. Well, it's interesting, you know, I don't think we want Labour by default. I don't think the British public want Labour by default. I think there's a question, as Linda was saying, about what does Sir Keir Starmer stand for. He's applied a thin veneer over a Labour Party that mm. he supported mm. with Jeremy Corbyn, which mm. people did recognise, whether they supported it or not, mm. because they knew what Jeremy Corbyn and his Labour believed in. And I think yes. Chris is right when he talks about football teams without strikers, <laughs> because you've got two political parties who are trying to re-establish their political base. The Conservatives have had the challenge of, yes, almost 14 years in government, obviously as a coalition originally, but then Brexit, Covid, war, various huge mm. global yep. issues to deal yep. with that have fundamentally challenged Conservative beliefs to the, to the core. What the Conservative Party had to do and what Boris Johnson had to do to get the country through Covid didn't feel Conservative. I didn't feel very yep. Conservative doing it. But... You know, and we, it was illegal. Yeah. <laughs> now we have the public, and a lot of it, I see the polling as well, a lot of people are concerned about what are they voting for when they vote Conservative. Exactly. The people who voted for the Conservative Party in 2019, I think still half are undecided. So there's a bit to play for there for Rishi Sunak to get, yes, his plan out there, but the Conservative beliefs, which I think we'll talk about later, yes, about yeah. whether, mm, we, just we, whether yeah. people believe in the Conservative Party and what they're about. Once they get those beliefs... Then they'll make the decision. I, I want to just Linda's point about what will happen on. in the locals. Yeah. There probably will be a bloody nose given to the government. It generally is mm. at this point in the political cycle. And it's really sad because Conservative councillors take the hit, or the councillors, whoever, will lose at that point. Yeah, but it's much more than usual. It's much, much uh, more than true. usual. True. But I think there's a path to play towards a general election when people take a different view. Because so yeah, you've not given up the fight yet. You think it's no, all to pay for in the autumn? Yeah. I, I think Are you on record as saying you think the Conservatives think, can win? It's over. I think it'll be much closer than people it, well, think. It might be what does closer. that mean, Colby Ranger? What does closer mean? I think there's a fight to be had. The, well, what I'm are the Tories gonna, fighting for? A uh, hung parliament? No, the Tories are fighting, uh, as the Prime Minister said, and I was at a 1922 meeting with him. Name dropper. <laughs> or meeting dropper. <laughs> What's he like in real life? Is he that short? <laughs> OK. Well, they're, they're, fighting, they're fighting to, to re-establish what, in the minds of the, this country, what the Conservative Party stands. Well, close only, Jubilee, counts, in, clo close only counts in land grenades, ballroom dancing and elections. You either win or you lose. Good stuff. OK, well, listen, Rishi Sunak is a political giant in my view, but, of course, that's an unfashionable view. What is yours? Mark at GBnews.com. Lots more to get through, let me tell you. Next up, uh, after a shock poll of local Tory councillors, are the Conservatives now too left-wing? I'll be speaking to Philip Davies, MP, who strongly disagrees and makes the case for Sunak being the most Conservative PM since Margaret Thatcher. Well, my pundits don't agree. We'll debate that next. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. Is it OK to call people fat? I won't call Bev fat, cos she isn't. She <laughs> won't call me fat, cos I'm not. But the fitness fanatic, Derek Evans, you might know him better as 90s icon, Mr Motivator, recently he's told a podcast, diabetes have gone through the roof. And you should be able to call people fat. Well, he joins us now. Good morning, Derek. Good morning. Good morning. 
Great to see you. So I think what you're getting you. at is this idea that we've become so polite about weight that we're ignoring the elephant in the room. Um, if you'll forgive the <laughs> forgive the phraseology there, and actually sure. sometimes you've got to be cruel to be kind. Well, actually, you know, this has been taken out of all context. I actually didn't say you're entitled to call people fat. What I did say is that in the 80s and 90s, I remember the way I got into television, there was a gentleman walking at reception while I was waiting for the people I was training. And for some reason, I got up and I prodded him in the belly. And I said to him, you need to deal with that. That was fat. We have a nation where obesity, diabetes is killing every one of us. Mm. And unless we take responsibility for our health, rather than waiting for government to do this, government to do that, it is our responsibility, right, to look after our independence and our health. And as we get older, it's even more critical, right? And that's why I'm here as an example saying to you, listen, I'm 71 years of age and movement is medicine. And you can't sit around watching television and not going out to the gym or wherever, you will never ever be able to look after your family and everything you've worked for, you will lose it. I've never seen a hearse, uh, sorry, a deposit account behind a hearse. Mm. I've ne no matter what you work for, the most important thing you can do with your life is every hour, do something active. Every hour. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Well, a big reaction to my big opinion. A Labour government is coming, and I don't know anyone that's looking forward to it. Well, the emails, as I say, have been plentiful in their supply. Uh, Starmer will not be our next PM, so I wouldn't worry your cotton socks, says Richard. Uh, Michael says, Mark, I'd sooner slit my throat than vote for Starmer. My goodness, please don't do that, Michael. Uh, Alan says, uh, regarding your big opinion, a Starmer far-left Labour government would see the end of democracy. Be warned, we are in dangerous waters. If Labour were in power during the pandemic, I think we'd have double the national debt that we have already, says Alex. However, Graham is not happy with the Tories. He says uh, all three million self-employed contractors are waiting for Sunak at the ballot box for what he did to us during COVID and with IR35. Labour is the pain that we will all face to drain the swamp. And lastly, Verna. What a lovely name that is. Good evening, Verna. How are you? Verna says, Mark, why are none of your guests mentioning reform as a good, true UK alternative party? Lots of people I know on many political sites are turning to them with their support. Thank you for that. Keep the emails coming. Mark at gbnews.com. But it's time now for the big story. And a shock new poll reveals that almost half of Tory councillors think that Rishi Sunak's government is too left-wing. A Savanta survey found that 47% believed that the Conservative Party under the PM's leadership has headed leftwards politically and no longer reflects true Conservative values. Now, writing exclusively for the GB News website, the Conservative MP for Shipley, Philip Davies, defends his party and argues that Rishi Sunak is the most right-wing Prime Minister since Margaret Thatcher. Well, he made quite a splash with that article. Do check it out on our website. I'm delighted to say that Philip Davies joins me now. Philip, good to see you again. Uh, wokery in our public institutions, high taxes, high immigration, high inflation. Sounds like a pretty left-wing government to me. Yeah, they're all things, Mark, that Rishi Sunak inherited when he became prime minister. They're not things that he created. I, I think even Jacob Rees-Mogg 
who is one of uh, Boris Johnson's uh, greatest supporters, admitted that the immigration figures uh, that we saw, the the, the, the two years, over 600,000 net immigration, they were Boris Johnson's immigration figures. They weren't Rishi Sunak's. And Rishi Sunak has actually got to work and changed the immigration rules. He's made sure that, for example, you have to earn more now before you're allowed to come into the country or you're allowed to sponsor somebody to come into the country. He's changed the rules to stop dependents coming into the country. In fact, I've had a letter from uh, my local university at Bradford University saying it's absolutely terrible what Rishi Sunak's done to immigration because it's going to really damage our income from foreign students uh, as, as a result. So Rishi Sunak has actually improve the situation on legal immigration. He's, he's passed through the House of Commons, the Rwanda bill, which makes clear on the front of it, it does not comply with the European Convention of Human Rights, which is something I think that people were crying out for the government to do, not to just stick to the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, we've started cutting taxes uh, too slowly, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, but nevertheless, we've started cutting taxes. He's pushed back the ridiculous rush to net zero. Boris was a net zero fanatic, of course, and, and uh, insisted that we all got to, uh, we banned all the uh, dry, uh, petrol and diesel cars by 2030 and oil and gas boilers by 2030. Rishi, thankfully, has pushed that back. I'd, I'd like that to go further, but at least he's moving in the right direction. He's scrapped the white elephant of HS2, uh, which was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, in the past, he's cut our foreign aid budget. I mean, all of these things, whether people think they go far enough or not, Surely everyone has to accept they're all moving in the right direction and we're in a far better and more conservative position now than the situation he inherited uh, when he became Prime Minister. Well, Philip, I may self-confessed Sunak Spartan and I think he's a good Prime Minister, but I'm on my own on that one, aren't I? Why are so many of my viewers and listeners watching and listening to this show tonight flocking to Reform UK, presumably because they are offering a more traditionally conservative set of policies? Well, I think the, the one issue in the room is, is immigration, and particularly, you know, both legal and, and illegal immigration. That's the one big issue that's, that's driving people to reform. I don't think many people know that Rishi Sunak's changed the rules so that 300,000 fewer people a year will be allowed to come into the country as a result of the changes he's made. I don't think he's done a very good job at communicating that. And, of course, we still need to go further. That still leaves immigration too high, but it's a very good start. And we obviously we need to see the Rwanda policy come into fruition, which people are very, very frustrated that it hasn't, me included, I might add. Uh, so people have got to see that those things will work, and that's why people are sort of out of frustration supporting reform. But, but look, there's two ways to ensure that Keir Starmer wins a massive majority at the general election. One's to vote Labour and one's to vote reform. So it seems to me if you don't think the, the Conservative government's being conservative enough, it seems very strange to me that the solution to that problem is to elect Keir Starmer with a 200-seat majority. That seems to be a strange reaction to a, a, having a government that you don't think is conservative enough. Uh, let's bring in, if we can, Philip, my brilliant pundits tonight. Stay where you are. We've got former advisor to the aforementioned Boris Johnson, political communicator Lord Culvia Ranger, journalist and communications advisor Linda Jubilee, and author and campaigner for children in care, Chris Wilde. Uh, Linda, why do you think these councillors have decided that their own party isn't Conservative anymore? Well, because that's what they believe. <laughs> Are they right? <laughs> <laughs> because they go out, they go out into um, their areas and they talk to people and they're being told something. Remember that councillors, uh, with all due respect to, to um, Phil, who's an MP I, I like and admire, councillors are actually out on the ground talking to people and these councillors are listening to what they're being told. I remember Danny Fink Finkelstein once saying um, in The Times years ago, the voters always write, a mm. bit like the customer. In fact, you have to pay attention to what they're saying and if they believe something, mm. work it out. Now, Chris, what do you think is happening inside the Tory party? I just think, for me, they're, they're, they're the most right they've ever been since I've got into politics over the last few years. But I think anything moderate or central right looks left to them. And I think about left-wing politics. People think it's soft politics. It really isn't. Um, and, and, and a good point to make as well is that I think that the Conservatives are afraid of Reform UK. So they're just doing everything they can to win votes at the moment. So that's what's happening. Uh, Kulveer, where do we go from here? This is a major headache for Rishi Sunak, isn't it? 
It's a major headache, but it's a, an interesting poll, which I believe is paid for by Labour Together exactly. as well. So it's yes, interesting who exactly. wants to know this information. <laughs> because if you've got a party that's struggling overall in the polls and has been for a while, and of course is facing some challenges in the locals that are coming up, you will have disaffected councillors. But as Chris just said, you know, this Conservative government is probably further to the right than it has been in the last 14 years as a political movement. It's cracking down on immigration, it's cracking down on law and order, it's looking to cut taxes, it's looking to get away with, uh, get rid of um, national insurance. It's trying to generate economic growth. It's doing everything in its power, having suffered the challenges and the micro, the macro global shocks to the economy of COVID and the war in Ukraine. So it's really trying to get that conservative engine going. And it, yes, the government is struggling to do it. It's combating all the different forces that are working against it, including the issue that it needs to get its message across. And I think that's where the Prime Minister has mm. his, his biggest mm. challenge, because mm. okay. the small boats, the cutting the waiting lists, all of these things are his plan, and he needs to okay. do those things, but he needs to show Conservative values and beliefs doing it. Briefly, Philip, um, if there is such a hunger out there for true Conservatism, why are the British public about to elect a Labour government? <sighs> Well, uh, we'll see if they they do or not, but I think it's out, born out of frustration. I, I don't meet anybody on the streets who's uh, enthusiastic about Keir Starmer or Angela Rayner or a Labour government. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Mm. They're, they're frustrated about the Conservative Party, and, and there's no doubt that since 2019, we haven't been Conservative enough for many of the reasons that Colby mentioned, like, for example, COVID, where we had, a, we had socialism in action. Uh, mm. through the lockdowns. But uh, I don't actually think people are looking for the, to the Labour Party. They just are frustrated with the Conservatives and they want a reason to vote for us. Uh, but it, Conservative MPs and Conservative activists have got to get behind the Prime Minister and tell people what he's doing. Rather than okay. complaining about it, actually uh, tell people all the good things he's doing. Philip, a great article in the GB News website. Thank you so much for joining us. Send our best to Esther and we'll catch up soon. My thanks there to Philip Davies MP, Conservative MP for Shipley. Coming up next with tonight's top pundits and a special guest. Six months on, has Israel gone too far in its response to October the 7th? Plus, in an exclusive Mark Dolan tonight People's Poll, we've been asking, are the Tories too left-wing? Well, the results are in. I shall reveal all next. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office. We hold on to rather unsettled weather across the UK during the week ahead. Further spells of rain in most areas and often quite windy too. Storm Kathleen starting to move away towards the north and uh, northeast of the UK now, but notice low pressure gathering once again towards the southwest, and it's this that will bring further wet and windy weather over the next couple of days. Back to the detail for this evening and overnight, and it's a fairly quiet picture for many areas, at least for a time, because notice there's uh, more wet weather coming in across the southwest of the UK into parts of Wales, and the very blustery showers we've seen recently up towards the northwest will gradually ease into the early hours. Temperatures dipping down to mid-single figures towards the north under the clearest spells overnight, but uh, starting to rise tonight as the cloud and rain comes up from the south and southwest. There'll be some bright weather around tomorrow across some of the eastern areas during the morning, but a showery burst of rain already gathering down towards the south and southwest, becoming more widespread across England and Wales into the afternoon, and some of those turning quite heavy. Northern Ireland, after a bright start, will see some rain in the afternoon, so it's Scotland that's set to see the best of the weather, here plenty of sunshine and feeling pleasant enough in light winds, with temperatures up to about 12 degrees. Tuesday looks like being a very unsettled day across all areas. We have warnings in force for wind and rain, wettest weather, they're likely towards the northeast of the UK, and the windiest conditions generally down towards the south and southwest. But wherever you are, a pretty blustery and wet day to come, and it stays quite unsettled during the week ahead, perhaps a bit warmer and a bit drier come Thursday. But generally speaking, very unsettled. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Earlier in an exclusive Mark Dolan Tonight People's Poll, I've been asking, are the Tories too left-wing? Well, it's a landslide, but the wrong kind for the Tories. 86.3% say yes, the Tories are too left-wing. No, 13.7%. A quick email from Sean in Bridlington. Good evening, Sean. Thank you for your email. Uh, the Conservative Party ought to be forced to change their name as they appear to despise conservatism. They only want soft lefty Lib Dem types as candidates. I wouldn't vote for them again if they paid me says Sean. Now, today marks the six-month anniversary of the October the 7th attack on Israel, the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. Nearly 700 Israeli citizens were murdered, including 36 children, alongside 373 military personnel and 71 foreigners. Many died in horrific and degrading ways, subjected to rape, torture and dismemberment. But in its pursuit of revenge and with its stated military aim of wiping out Hamas, with over 30,000 deaths in Gaza and counting, and with the region suffering unprecedented hunger, injuries and disease, has the Israeli reaction been too strong? Let's get the views now of Liz Truss's biographer and top political correspondent at The Spectator magazine, James Heal. James, good to have you back on the show. Uh, your thoughts on this. Uh, the Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, has expressed concerns about aspects of the Israeli response. Could we reach a point where British diplomats remove their support for Israel? Well, I think there's a risk of that happening here and in other countries around the world. I would say we're not at the point where, you know, we're openly saying that you know, Israel's gone too far, for instance. But I do think it was quite striking the line walked uh, by Oliver Dowden in this morning's interview round when he talked mm. about Israel fighting a legitimate campaign that, of course, we expect obligations of Israel that we don't expect of Hamas, for instance, but also making clear that there are concerns, particularly around issues around aid getting into the country. And so I think it's about in Israel's own self-interest to consider the way in which other countries are responding to what happened last week, uh, this week on Monday, particularly with the killing of seven aid workers. And you see the reaction uh, here in the UK, the, also the comments of, uh, Don, of Tusk of Poland and Anthony Albanese of Australia. So I think from you know concern of Israel's own self-interest, needs to make sure that it's got international support with it. Uh, and that's, I think, the key thing to bear in mind when it's conducting its campaign in order to avoid any kind of careless oversteps, for instance, and et cetera. Yes. Now, James, uh, Hamas, of course, were responsible for that appalling attack on October the 7th. It's the six-month anniversary today. Hamas have weaponized human life by building headquarters under hospitals and storing weapons in children's nurseries. So on October the 7th, they set out to do harm, and they've said that they will do it again and again. Meanwhile, Israel have warned locals to leave areas when an attack is coming, and they sought, of course, to minimize casualties. Yet Israel seemed to be losing the PR war. Why? Well, I think, of course, Israel has been a state that's always faced hatred ever since its uh, creation in the late 1940s. And so there's partly a historic reason there in terms of Israel's view in the Middle East as well and how it's viewed by other countries. Um, I think it's also about interesting, Mark, about different perspe perceptions. I was having this conversation with a minister the other day, actually, and they made the point that, you know, I, I'd, you know if you talk about sort of liberal opinion in, in the UK, for instance, some people think, oh, you know, Israel is using its high-tech weaponry to you know, attack Palestinians. But, of course, that's just one view about who is the 
underdog in these in this crisis. The other view, of course, is that Israel is surrounded by countries you know that loathe it, and of course has always been under attack ever since its creation. So I think it depends on one's own standpoint on it. And of course, given the whole history of, of Israel in the Middle East, these are the tensions that go back um, centuries. So I think that there's no surprise there that this is going to be a conflict that continues to exercise and agitate, um, not least because because when other countries are involved, for instance, if British aid workers are killed, that obviously starts sparks off a debate here. So I think there's nothing new in all of this. I, I think partly is also thanks to social media, we're seeing all the pictures brought home, those are tr- horrific atrocities of the 7th of mm. October and all the fallout. They've all come to the fore and watching it on 24-7 media. Now, the renowned Jewish actress Maureen Lipman has said that left-wing actors protesting against Israel are close to fascism. Why are the political left so quick to criticise Israel, do you think? I think it's a long-standing fashionable cause in many ways. Uh, I think if you go back, it was the really striking thing of post-war history is that originally Israel was seen as a left-wing cause and uh, a lot of the old left-wingers were very much supportive of uh, on the the aftermath of the Holocaust, for instance. And then I think from the 70s onwards, it's really been a sort of great shift with, you know, Thatcher was seen as a great supporter of Israel uh, and the left reorganised itself in the 80s and 90s consecutively. I think also it's misunderstanding perhaps sometimes about how the whole history of Israel is. And again, I say it's about who one empathises with and sympathises with in this conflict. And so I think a lot of uh, left-wing actors perhaps take the side of the Palestinians, perhaps not considering, of course, what it's like to live in Israel under constant threat of terror. Is hatred of Israel anti-Semitic, do you think? It can be, and we've seen, sadly, disappointingly, um, some manifestations of that in some of the criticisms, and that's why I think it's so important to have the kind of debate around Israel and Palestine conducted in a, in a way which makes sure that there's none of those kind of uh, associations that we've seen all too frequently since 7th October. I, I think it's worth remembering what happened six months ago today. It was truly barbaric, wasn't it? Not just the loss of life, but the torture, the rape, um, the most appalling crimes... And yet, and yet, Israel is the bad guy. How much of a problem is the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, do you think, James? Well, this is what's so striking. And actually, if you look at the reaction this week, uh, he's very unpopular within his own country. Uh, Benny Gantz, the opposition uh, main leader within his own um, the war cabinet was actually suggesting fresh elections sooner than expected uh, later this year. So I think that, that you know, look, there is real concern within Israel about what's going on. And I think actually, you know, that ought to give pause to thought for some critics of Israel, which is actually there is a live and active debate going on in Israel uh, in a democracy. Um, and it shows that, you know, it's not a sort of monolithic approach of this. And certainly it's not a debate that Hamas would ever allow within its own ranks. Uh, my thanks to James Heal from The Spectator. Catch up soon, James. Thank you very much for Bye. your time. Coming up in My Take at 10, you won't want to miss this. It's just 20 minutes from now. It's must-see telly. My Take at 10, Angela Rayner and the political scandal that will not go away. I'll be dealing with Labour's deputy leader in no uncertain terms at 10. You won't want to miss it. But first, my Mark Neat's guest is the world-renowned biographer of King Charles, who will give us the inside story of our remarkable monarch's short but challenging reign. He's live in the studio, one of the best journalists in the country. That's next. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Children's stories like Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland now come with a trigger warning at universities. Universities alerting readers to possible themes of white supremacy. Yes, quote, these unquote. warnings are being applied to quo, wo, colonial narratives. That's that's the claim commonly found in adventure stories and famous novels from the uh, Victorian era. Well, joining us now is the actor Charlie Lawson. And, and Charlie, um, these warnings have been applied to Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland. I, uh, what's, what's this university getting at? Well, look, first of all, this isn't um, this is nothing new. Um, uh, we hadn't heard about it for a while. Universities have been doing this over the last couple of years. I remember having a chat with one of your colleagues. But when Gabriella, the lovely Gabby, phoned me up today, I, I had to beg her to put me on after nine o'clock because I, I found myself <laughs> getting rather irate about the whole thing. But I will do my best to be very polite. Uh, yes, keep it clean. Said, yes, look, which is quite difficult for me, as you'll appreciate over this subject. Look, this is universities just jumping on the same, rel- you know, trying to be relative, relevant bandwagon. Uh, you know, is it any wonder that um, you, we look at the quality of um, graduates from university and, and in my humble opinion, um, some of them are slightly disappointing. 
But I did phone a couple of people I knew who had sons and daughters at various leading universities, and they had been speaking this morning. And thank the Lord, they think it's a complete load of bloody nonsense, as I do. Give the C.S. Lewis Centre a ring in East Belfast, because that's where your man came from. And I think you'll find you'll get short shrift because we're not all about that in East Belfast. We don't censor anything. Join me, Camilla Tominey, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. This report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Coming up in my Take It 10, Angela Rayner and the political scandal that won't go away. But first, Mark me. Yes, indeed, time for Mark Meets, and tonight the renowned historian, broadcaster and Daily Mail journalist Robert Hardman, whose book, Queen of Our Times, The Life of Elizabeth II, was the Sunday Times Biography of the Year. Well, his latest book is all about our new monarch. Charles III, New King, New Court, The Inside Story. Well, it's a book which has won rave reviews and is out now. Robert Hardman, welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Thank you, Mark. Uh, let's start with some very positive news. Charles and Camilla celebrate 19 years of marriage mm -hmm. this week. Was this a union that was meant to be? Well, looking back on it, yes. And I remember the day in, in Windsor Castle um, back in 2005. And it did, it did feel like a turning point, actually, because they had been through, uh, particularly um, Camilla and Mrs Parker Bowles, as she then was in the, in the, in the late 90s, had, had been much vilified uh, in certain sections of the media. But it, it was a true love story, and that's mm. been seen to be the case. And she's absolutely... I mean, her role now, I mean, she's so central to the, mm. the whole royal... Set up, and we are so lucky to have her. Frankly, uh, as we've seen in the last few weeks, with mm. with the state of play, that um, you know, it's it's yeah, it's it's definitely a cause for celebration. I think. And she's not somebody that ever set out or particularly wanted no. to be queen. No, I mean, absolutely not. It was it just wasn't her, her her sort of thing. I mean, it was it was you know, the, the, she she first met um, the then Prince of Wales. I mean, way back in the early seventies, their life obviously took different course. Um, but uh, it, it was, you know, ultimately it was a, it was a love story that was that was meant to be, and and you know she has taken to to, to royal duties with a with I think with a with with a, a, a real degree of not just enthusiasm but but sort of determination. I think particularly, I mean, I you know I'm a writer, um, and she's a great stalwart of the written word, and it's not mm. just the odd sort of token patronage here and there. I mean, she's. For now, for for the best part of fifteen years now, has been um, supporting very. I mean, a, a wide range of literary organisations from the Commonwealth Essay Prize and the National Literacy Trust and Book Aid International. She really gets into a subject, and she she champions it. And it's the same with domestic violence. I mean, she does a lot of stuff that we don't see just because that particular subject is so uh, sensitive that you know it's not that it, it, she can't turn up with a camera crew. But she 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 absolutely. Uh, uh, she, she's busy. And she's an unfussy, no-nonsense character, mm. isn't she? she? Yeah, she is. And she also with a sort of sense of humour. I mean, she's not you, grand. No, no. I mean, well, she's the queen. I mean, you know, you, she... But she's, you know, people sort of forget. They sort of accidentally call her your royal highness or forget to call her your majesty. I mean, it took several months, actually, after the king's accession for her to remember that she was her majesty. People mm. would be sort of saying, oh, your majesty, and she'd just be sort of looking around. So, oh, golly, that's me, you know. Um, so, yeah, she's, she's not... Uh, um, she, 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 she's, she's, she's very approachable. She's very popular. And you notice this. I, I think it's very telling that if you look back at all the time she's been, been royal, as it were, I mean, almost zero turnover of staff, which I always think is a very good indicator of, yeah. of how somebody looks after other people. Which takes us to Meghan and Harry. Um, 
what um, has has the, the drama um, relating to Harry and Meghan? What sort of pain has that brought to King Charles? Do you think? How much has he suffered as a result of so-called Megxit? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I, he's from right from the start was was sad that his you know his son was sort of leaving not just the country but leaving royal life. I mean, it, it was a, a source of. I think great pain to him, but I mean, particularly since he's become king, he's got so many other things to worry about. And because it's, they've made it abundantly clear that's that's the future, mm. um, and there isn't really a, a, a negotiation to be had. I mean, in, in his uh, one of his interviews around that sort of rather frenetic time towards the end of 2022, when you had Harry and Meghan, you had the sort of the six-part um, Netflix documentary followed rapidly by the the book Spare. Uh, and, and in the interviews surrounding it, Harry kept talking about, you know, he was waiting for this apology from the family. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, uh, well, carry on waiting. I mean, they, you know, they've got other things to do. I mean, I th he clearly, you know, he, he, he loves his son, the king. Uh, you know, is his... the door open still? Yeah, yeah, the door is always open. I mean, there's, there's a different dynamic between the brothers. Mm. That's, you know, been much analysed. I think that's possibly going to be, uh, take, take, take more time. But, uh, I mean, the, the king is very much, he, he is... He's not one for a sort of for a feud. I mean, the, the, it's it's very much let's you know if 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 we can make this work, if one day we mm. can kind of normalise a situation where where Harry and Meghan and the children, because you know he, he'd love to see his grandchildren. You know, if 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 it can be if a situation can evolve where they can come and go and and there can be a more sort of uh, uh, easygoing relationship, I think everyone would be happy. So you don't think necessarily you don't identify that that Charles is bitter or angry about the situation with the Sussexes, just a little hurt and a little disappointed. Yeah, I, bitter, bitter and angry. He's got so much else mm. going on, so many other things to worry about. Uh, that that it's it's not really his style either. I mean, you also you look at the way that I think that he's, you know, he 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 does take a sort of rather like the late Queen as well took a a sort of big tent approach. I mean, I think the way, for example, that um, at family events only at family events, but you know, the Duke of York is still there. And not only that, but his his ex wife is welcome as well. I, I, mm. He you know he he does. Um, I, I he he he's he's. You know, he's a man of faith, and I think he does have a sort of uh, a, a kind of Christian sense of, uh, of forgiveness. How is he doing the job differently to his mother, Queen Elizabeth II? Well, it's it, clearly every generation does things slightly differently. I mean, it is a more, uh, it was a less formal operation. I mean, I think we saw that right from the start. I mean, if you look back to the immediate hours and days after the death of Elizabeth II, um, after she succeeded to the throne in 1952, uh, Britain had to wait ten and a half months to hear the new sovereign speak in public, um, and it was many months of court mourning, and, and, and you know it was a long time before, if you like, the sort of the new reign got going. Whereas with Charles III, I mean, it was right there from the start. Within 24 hours of becoming king, he was on the airwaves. I thought it was very telling that the next day, the day after his mother's death, he flew down from Scotland and he went straight to Buckingham Palace. So there were all these crowds outside and I was there with them. Uh, and the car stopped outside the gates. Didn't go through, which is what we all expected. Stopped outside and he got out and immediately started talking to people. He does love the sort and of public... Shaking and hands and shaking hands and shaking hands. Receiving hugs, even. Yeah, the very first person he went up to was a lady who was in floods of tears. And he mm. went up and was about trying to sort of offer a hand. And she said, can I give you a hug? He said, of course. Now, uh, you know, someone inside the palace said to me, I, I don't think anyone would have asked the late queen for a hug, and had they done so, probably wouldn't have got one. You know, that's a sort of... It's just a sort of tonal shift. There's a more transparent approach to uh, to events now. I mean, you know, things like... I mean, for example, seeing the Accession Council live on television. I mean, that would mm. have been unheard of. Um, events at the palace, obviously, they're off-limits at the moment. The king isn't hosting parties because he can't on doctor's orders. But, I mean, up until... Um, a, a few weeks ago, he was, and 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 they're 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 less formal than they used to be. There's just this sort of, I mean, obviously, he's still the king. It's still the palace. There still has to be these levels of, of grandeur. That's what people want. I mean, they want things to feel royal. Um, but uh, for example, there are fewer sort of greeting lines. There are fewer. There, there just mm. there's just been a sort of dialing down slightly of. Uh, of some of the, the protocol and the etiquette. And it's just a reflection of he is of a different, different generation. And, and of course, uh, his openness about his health yeah. issues and his cancer diagnosis. Um, there are other aspects of the book that are absolutely compelling. Um, is Charles haunted by the memory of Diana? Uh, no, I think he, I mean, you know, he, when you've been through the most, well, to start with, the most celebrated and famous 
fairy tale wedding probably of all time and then to have gone through uh, the pain of the most uh, celebrated and scrutinized uh, marriage breakup of all time I mean I, I think you you, 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 you you get used to you, you find an ability to sort of compartmentalize that mm. um, and I think you know he did uh, go through uh, a, a period when yeah the, the, the media particularly you know not, not just here but around the world um, was 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 hostile, you know, very hostile to him. And the, the people talked about the War of the Wales as it became a sort of mm -hmm. media shorthand. Uh, and what he did then, and what he's done through subsequent crises, you, you get on with it. You, you know, he, his 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 relationship with Diana wasn't as it wasn't as, 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 as sort of you know hostile as you see things like the Crown sort of portraying it as a as as, as a sort of constant. Uh, battle of wits and, and, and a constant attempt to undermine uh, the princess. It just wasn't like that at all. I mean, it was, it was a breakdown of a marriage. But I mean, you know, if you look at the stats for all the couples married in the same year as Charles and Diana, 28%. Um, by the time they had split up, had split up. So, and they I mean, didn't have their own plates or tea towels. <laughs> didn't. Uh, was, was the marriage, that marriage, Charles and Diana, was it a mistake? Because the perception is that Diana was deeply in love with Charles and Charles was not in love with Diana. Yeah, that's a sort of that's become a kind of media shorthand. But I, I, mm. I think it is like any relationship; it's far more sort of complex than that. There are sides of it we won't really know. I mean, the fact is, he's you know the the result of that marriage is, is William and Harry, who he adores, he's devoted to. I mean, you know, like any any family who've been through this sort of thing. I mean, of course, there are going to be regrets on all sides. Mm. But um, I think you know the world can look back at how. Uh, in the aftermath of the death of Diana, what happened next? You know, the fact that you know he was he was a, a doting dad, and uh, and and yes, of course, uh, um, things have, have, have gone in all sorts of directions with with the with the Sussexes, but. Uh, you know, it's 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 where we are. Robert, a uh, couple of seconds left. Let me just wave the book at uh, <laughs> my you. director, Cam, there. It is uh, at Rand. It is very good. Charles III, New King, New Court, The Inside Story. A couple of seconds. Uh, we're praying for a speedy recovery mm -hmm. uh, for Charles and for Catherine as well. Mm -hmm. um, briefly, what can he hope to achieve in the years ahead if he's um, if he hopefully recovers? Which we Well, I, I think what he's already done is he's steadied the ship after the longest reign in history. Uh, and, and if you look at the back, just not long before uh, the death of the Queen, immediately afterwards, you had a lot of critics saying, oh, well, who, who can possibly fill her shoes? Well, he has. There you go. And, and the fact is, the monarchy compared, you know, faith and, and general trust in the monarchy with the political system. There we are. You tell me which is more trusted. Brilliant, Robert Hartman, you're so right. Uh, long live the King. Next up, I'll be dealing with Queen Angela Rayner. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office. We hold on to rather unsettled weather across the UK during the week ahead. Further spells of rain in most areas and often quite windy too. Storm Kathleen starting to move away towards the north and uh, northeast of the UK now, but notice low pressure gathering once again towards the southwest, and it's this that will bring further wet and windy weather over the next couple of days. Back to the detail for this evening and overnight, and it's a fairly quiet picture for many areas, at least for a time, because notice there's uh, more wet weather coming in across the southwest of the UK into parts of Wales, and the very blustery showers we've seen recently up towards the northwest will gradually ease into the early hours. Temperatures dipping down to mid single figures towards the north under the clearest spells overnight, but uh, starting to rise tonight as the cloud and rain comes up from the south and southwest. There'll be some bright weather around tomorrow across some of the eastern areas during the morning, but a showery burst of rain already gathering down towards the south and southwest, becoming more widespread across England and Wales into the afternoon, and some of those turning quite heavy. Northern Ireland, after a bright start, will see some rain in the afternoon, so it's Scotland that's set to see the best of the weather, here plenty of sunshine, and feeling pleasant enough in light winds, with temperatures up to about 12 degrees. Tuesday looks like being a very unsettled day across all areas. We have warnings in force for wind and rain, wettest weather, they're likely towards the northeast of the UK, and the windiest conditions generally down towards the south and southwest. But wherever you are, a pretty blustery and wet day to come, and it stays quite unsettled during the week ahead, perhaps a bit warmer and a bit drier come Thursday. But generally speaking, very unsettled. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News.
With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for me. My guest and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good evening, it's 10 o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my take of 10, Angela Rayner and the political scandal that won't go away. I'll be dealing with Labour's deputy leader in no uncertain terms in just a couple of minutes and you won't want to miss it. Also tonight, after years of defence cuts, is Britain vulnerable to foreign attack? Plus, has Brexit diminished the UK as a country? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker, the formidable Anne Whittacombe. Plus, tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from tonight's top pundits. Lots to get through, folks. A very busy hour to come. Obviously, waiting in the wings, Angela Rayner. I'm not pulling my punches, but first the headlines and Tatiana Sanchez. Mark, thank you. The top stories this hour. Thousands of Israelis have been gathering in Jerusalem this evening, calling for the release of hostages still being held by Hamas. In Tel Aviv, candles were lit for the hostages. It comes as today marks six months since the terror attack on October 7th. All families of hostages also joined a rally in London to call for the release of hostages, saying the six months after the attack have been hell. Marking the occasion, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has said the government continues to stand by Israel's right to defend its security and added the UK is shocked by the bloodshed. He called for an immediate humanitarian pause in fighting. He also urged Hamas to release its hostages and implored Israel to get aid into Gaza more swiftly. 
Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary has used the occasion to stress that the UK's support for Israel is not unconditional. Writing in the Sunday Times, Lord Cameron said there's no doubt where the blame lies over the death of three British aid workers and added this must never happen again. John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby died in airstrikes carried out by the IDF on an aid convoy on the 1st of April. The Deputy Prime Minister has denied claims that the UK is failing to prepare for war. Oliver Dowden is defending the government after outgoing Armed Forces Minister James Heapy told The Telegraph only Ministry of Defence officials attended a wartime preparation exercise which was meant for the whole of government. Former Defence Secretary Ben Wallace has backed him up, saying too many in government are just hoping everything goes away. Police have named a man they're searching for after a woman was stabbed to death in broad daylight in Bradford City Centre. West Yorkshire police detectives say they want to trace 25-year-old Habiba Masoom, who's from the Oldham area. They were called to the city centre yesterday afternoon following reports of an attack by a man who fled the scene. The woman was taken to hospital, where she later died. And a British man nicknamed Hardest Geezer has become the first person to run the length of Africa. Russell Cook, from Worthing in West Sussex, crossed the finish line in Tunisia today. He ran through 16 countries in 352 days. The 27-year-old said he'd struggled with his mental health, gambling and drinking, and he said he wanted to make a difference. And he's raised over £600,000 for charity. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's over to Mark. My thanks to Tatiana Sanchez, who returns in an hour's time. Welcome to a busy Mark Dolan tonight. After years of defence cuts, is Britain vulnerable to foreign attack? And has Brexit diminished the UK as a country? That's the view of David Miliband, former Labour Foreign Secretary. I'll get reaction from tonight's newsmaker, the formidable Anne Whittacombe. Plus, at tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from tonight's top pundits this evening. Former top advisor to Boris Johnson, Lord Culvia Ranger, journalist and communications advisor, Linda Jubilee, and author and campaigner for children in care, Chris Wilde. So, a packed hour, and those papers are coming, and Anne Whittacombe is waiting in the wings. But first, my take at 10. For such a vocal political figure, Angela Rayner, the self-named ginger growler, has fallen strangely quiet. Labour's deputy leader faces ongoing questions about profits from the sale of her council house nine years ago in a story that, like a nasty case of the common cold, just won't go away. And frankly, the story is nothing to be sneezed at. The allegations against Rayner are that she may owe tax on a profit she made when selling her home in Stockport in March 2015. Now, she insists that the house was her main residence when she sold it, which would exempt her from paying tax on the considerable £48,000 profit. A profit, I might add, that was thanks to Margaret Thatcher's transformative right-to-buy policy. However, today, in an explosive Mail on Sunday investigation, the paper claims that according to its own detailed analysis of Rayner's social media and Twitter accounts, it has evidence to suggest that the house was not her primary property. Their political editor, Glenn Owen, writes that they have seen dozens of online postings made by Rayner that show that between 2010 and 2015, she posted about her children and cats at her husband's address, which was a house a mile away from hers, including one particular post captioned, just got back from work. The Mail cites multiple examples of pictures taken at her residence that they say support their case. Now, Angela Rayner has denied any wrongdoing and has insisted that the home on Vicarage Road was her main address from 20, uh, 2007. She paid bills and council tax there and she was on the electoral roll at the property too. And she has received legal advice that she acted correctly. So that's great, isn't it? Nothing to see. End of my take at 10. Shall we have a cup of tea? Well, no, we can't. Because 
Prior to the Mail on Sunday investigation, neighbours of Miss Rayner have insisted that she was, in fact, living primarily about a mile away at a property on Lounders Lane. Former next-door neighbour Sylvia Hampson said that Rayner lived in the terrace home in Lounders Lane for a good six or seven years, despite the Labour MP's insistence that her main home was on Vicarage Road. This wily next-door neighbour told The Times newspaper, Angela lived there as a family with her partner Mark and the three kids. There is no doubt she was living there all the time. Now, the police have investigated this and found no evidence of any wrongdoing. A Labour spokesperson says the following professional advice, no capital gains tax was payable on the sale of Rayner's home. But the forthright neighbour, Sylvia Hampson, who is a very sprightly 83, is not having any of it. She went on to tell The Times, I saw her all the time, coming and going. Her mum would come and visit a lot. This was her home. Neighbour Sylvia goes on to say, and prepare for some strong language here, if she's saying she didn't live there, she is an effing liar. She definitely lived in that house. She can't say she didn't live there. I would swear on the Bible to that. Oh, dearie me. Now, this is just Sylvia Hampson's word, I should add. It's hearsay and not a smoking gun which incriminates the shadow deputy leader. And I happen to like Angela Rayner. She's outspoken, she's compelling, she speaks for millions of people who are struggling to make ends meet in this country. And I think she'd probably be a better leader than Sir Keir Starmer. And the non-payment of a small amount of tax is a sideshow. That is not the big story. The big story is about whether Angela Rayner, someone who seeks to be our next Deputy Prime Minister, was not straight about the facts. Now, in my view, there is no conclusive evidence that she lied. But the problem for Rayner is that she's not currently willing to publish the very tax advice which she claims exonerates her. And she has not shown that advice to her boss, the party leader, Sir Keir Starmer, which is why the story won't go away. This is, of course, the same Sir Keir Starmer, who is a complete stuck record about probity and propriety in public life a vocal critic of Tory sleaze and someone who relentlessly pursued Boris Johnson over party gates. Interestingly, there is no love lost between Rayner and her boss, with the leader of the opposition previously having tried to sack her, only to give her a promotion following a backlash. But I'm curious to see whether ongoing questions about Angela Rayner's housing situation could see her evicted from the shadow cabinet. For now, she'll have to lie low wherever she currently calls home. Now, responding to the initial allegations, Angela Rayner denies any wrongdoing. She posted on X at the time saying, I've never been a landlady, owned a property portfolio or been a nom-dom. As with the majority of ordinary people who sell their own homes, I was not liable for capital gains tax because it was my home and the only one that I owned. OK, your reaction, Mark, at gbnews.com. The bottom line is there is no tangible proof that she's been dishonest, but the story won't go away, and I think it matters, which is why I defend covering it in my Take at 10. So I'll hear from you shortly, Mark, at gbnews.com, but let's hear from my top pundits first up. Former advisor to Boris Johnson, Lord Coolvia Ranger, journalist and communications advisor, Linda Jubilee, and author and campaigner for children in care, Chris Wilde. Kulvia Ranger, does Angela Rayner have a case to answer? Look, like you, Mark, I, I also like Angela Rayner. I think she's an authentic politician in a world where people want authentic politicians and we want more people like her in politics. And I think this story is a bit of a non-story, actually. I, I think she's been clear about what she did. There's been an investigation into it. I know it sounds interesting that we have this uh, quite uh, vivacious 83-year-old neighbour who's uh, <laughs> uh, quite clear what she saw <laughs> and is aware of. But really, we're talking about, as you said, the person who could be the next deputy prime minister of this country. And I'm more interested in what she believes in, what she thinks needs to be fixed, how she'd go about it, and really for us to get dig deep into those things, because she's yeah. core to the Labour Party at the moment, 
and potentially a next government. And that's what I want to be really hauling her over the coals over and understanding about what she believes in. Uh, in spite of your very, very youthful demeanour, Linda Jubilee, you've been a stalwart <laughs> of Fleet Street for many years. What do you make of this story from Glenn Owen at the Mail on Sunday? Well, I mean, I think that these social media posts are not exactly explosive. And I think that a political editor should really have a lot more on his plate than this. Absolutely. I, I agree um, with what Kilver has said here, that we really want to be talking about her policies, what she believes in, what she's going to say, and what she's going to stand by towards the next election. I mean, the fact of the matter is that she, she and her husband, for a time they had separate households, they moved between the two, they're a typical blended family. I don't really see how you could effectively investigate this situation, and I don't think social media posts and repeating what the content is are, are actually proving... But Linda, it. Linda Jubilee, why won't she publish the legal advice she was given, and why won't she show that legal advice to her own boss, who, by the way, is a former top lawyer, Sir Keir Starmer. Well, I personally, I think she should show it. Um, and and, and if, it's, if it's good news, we can draw a line under it. Um, and if it's not, then we can, uh, we can move forward and see what we've got to say about it. I think she should publish that. But I think we're not dealing with, um, with a big deal here, and I think it's better not to sweat the small stuff. But it's a story that won't go away, Chris Wilde, and it's damaging to the Labour Party. Not, it's not damaging at all. It won't go away because it's the right-wing media which keep bringing it up to surface again. I know Angela, she's a great woman, she's very transparent, very passionate about her role. And to be honest, who cares? Look at the scandals, what the Tory party is up to. Nobody's talking about, you know, Tinder and PPE. It's very minor and she's a good politician and she will become the next leader, hopefully. Uh, do you not think... Uh, do you think it's not minor? Do you think it's minor? Let me know your thoughts, Mark, at gbnews.com. What I would say, Chris Wilde, is that if the shoe was on the other foot and Angela Rayner was a Conservative minister, Labour would be all over her like a rash. How dare you? <laughs> no. It's I true, isn't it? it would. I mean, it's what we've had, Linda Jubilee, from Keir Starmer, oh, this guy that's always going on about propriety and probity and yeah, God you know, knows what else uh, yeah, in public uh, I, life. And I tell you what, there is a level of hypocrisy about buying your house under a scheme outlined and launched by Margaret Thatcher and then pulling the trap door up after you've used it. The ladder, I mean, and the trap door. Yeah. But I, I think that's hypocritical and I think that hits at um, her character a little bit more and perhaps that is relevant to the voting public um, because I think when you benefit from a policy, you shouldn't be the first person to be standing by the, the abolition of it. Indeed. Uh, Kilvia, briefly, there's no love lost between Starmer and Rayner. I, I still think this is a potential political opportunity for Labour's adversaries. Well, I, I don't know because... Angela Rayner is doing a great job for Sir Keir Starmer. She's, she's his John Prescott to Tony mm. Blair. She provides the balance of that traditional Labour heartlands, the roots, uh, that give a certain sense of legitimacy to Keir mm. Starmer. I think he wants to keep her in situ. I saw that uh, dual written op-ed that they had last week. I was wondering, you know, when they changed the pen over as they're both writing it. <laughs> uh, and a lovely press conference they had. So he obviously wants her to hold her close uh, to to help him um, seal the deal with Labour voters as much as the rest of the country. So I think Sir Keir Starmer needs mm. Angela Rayner, which is another reason why he won't ask to see her, her legal mm. advice. Mm. Uh, John's not happy on email. Uh, Rayner is not honest and should be sacked. She hounded <laughs> Boris out of office and has called all of Tory supporters scum. OK, I'll get to, uh, I'll get to more of your emails, many of which are uh, almost as... Harshly worded as, as some of the comments previously made by Rayner herself. Um, I'll get to those shortly. But next up, after years of defence cuts, is Britain vulnerable to foreign attack? And has Brexit diminished the UK as a country? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker, the formidable Anne Widdicombe. She's next. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7pm. The big thing here, Tom, is, is it actually even credible or possible that by 2030 we're going to have... If we wanted neutral? to do it, 
Is it an engineering possibility? Yes. Mm. Could we do it if we wanted to? Yes, we could. But, but so far, we're not on course to doing it. But, um, this government has not done a particularly good job of trying to of doing what we could do if we set our mind to it. The question remains to be seen whether a Labour government would do better. You see, I wonder whether the only way you could even get anywhere near this is just to import more energy. And when we import stuff, from, we say, oh, oh, oh that's, that's, there's no carbon dioxide emissions. So really, I just wonder, and it's a bit like steel making and many other arguments, aren't we just conning ourselves? Well, I don't think we're conning ourselves. I think we're not putting in the effort we need to get to where we say we want to get to. And, you know, we can do this stupidly or we can do it smartly. And you and I have talked before about, yeah. well, if you build nuclear power stations, that's not a very smart way to do it. If you insulate well, people... Well, 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 you say that. Yeah, go on. Well, you didn't disagree <laughs> with me, as well, I recall. Uh, my worry <laughs> was... Maybe no, changing I mean, your mind. You're allowed look, to do look, that. Look, look, nuclear's fine, but we ain't going to have it by 2030. No, that's absolutely true. We yeah. certainly yeah. can agree about that. The, the key real thing is, what can you do fastest and quickest that will give drive people's bills down soonest? And that, for an incoming Labour government, driving bills down and incomes up will be their core priority. So what can you do? Well, the first thing you need to do is make every single building in this country leak tight, because we are... We we got Sorry? New building. No, every single building. And new buildings, all the buildings we've got, they should be critical national infrastructure. They're the leakiest buildings in Europe. That really reduces our competitiveness. I'm talking about not just homes, I'm also talking about uh, all of our small and medium-sized enterprises, where growth is going to come from. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. The Angela Rayner story that won't go away. That was my take at 10 and a big reaction on email mark at gbnews.com. Ernest says, Mark, the problem with Angela is that she screamed at every single Tory who has done wrong to resign or come clean. Uh, Linda and Chris, your pundits are typical lefties. Tory sleaze bad, Labour sleaze, a right wing witch hunt. Keith says, uh, you're three idiots on the panel. Unbelievable. Uh, Steve, I think this particular rabbit hole is going to go deeper and deeper as the weeks go by. Uh, she either needs to release her evidence or stand down. Meanwhile, Matthew says Rayner has done what most people in this country did, uh, bought their council house and flipped it for a profit. Do we ask all of them for their tax return? We'll get to more of your emails at 10.30, but it's time now for the newsmaker and the former defence secretary Ben Wallace and the outgoing defence minister James Heapy have slammed the government's defence policies with Wallace arguing that some in government are just hoping that threats to the UK will go away. Meanwhile, Heapy called on ministers to do more to get ready for conflict, saying the UK has failed to prepare for war. So is Britain now vulnerable to foreign attack? and too weak to protect Western values and interests abroad. Let's get the views of tonight's newsmaker, former government minister and broadcaster Anne Whittacombe. Anne, lovely to see you. Is Britain now a sitting duck to a foreign attack? I don't think so. If by what you mean, by that you mean uh, an attack on our homeland. Uh, because if there were to be an attack on the UK itself, physically on the UK, uh, then all NATO. Uh, would have to be involved. So we wouldn't be talking just about our meagre defences, and they are meagre these days. Uh, we would be talking about NATO. So I, I, I don't mm. think you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and find we've been invaded. Um, however, uh, what is undeniable is that we haven't got uh, the forces and the equipment that we need uh, in order to maintain, for example, 
um, our ownership of the Falkland. I mean, if Gaultier, the second Gaultier, he came along and said, I'm going to invade Argentina, um, then, uh, sorry, I'm going mad, aren't I? I'm going to invade the Falklands, uh, then we would not, or we would be hard put, we would be hard put to defend the Falklands. Uh, and similarly, um, of course, our duty is not just to defend our own homeland, it's to be a big part of NATO, and we are uh, in the sense that we um, we actually do pay our contribution, which a lot of countries don't. Uh, but we're still very thin on the ground compared to how we were. Mm. And if you remember, if you go back to the time when we were deployed simultaneously, our forces in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and the army said, oh, by the way, if you really do have a fireman strike, we won't be able to do anything uh, because we're already stretched to the full. That was then. Now we're even more reduced. And so if we had to do more than one thing at once, I don't know how well Britain would be placed. Um, but no, I don't expect to find the Russians on my front doorstep tomorrow. Uh, let's hope not. And uh, if they encounter you, then they're in trouble. And uh, Richard Drax has recently suggested we should have some form of national service. Would that improve the mindset of the nation and ready us for war? Well, uh, the whole point of national service is usually to skill the population in preparation for a war. Uh, and uh, an awful lot of countries now don't consider that necessary. But I think some very, very basic training uh, would be helpful. Uh, I'm not talking about bringing back uh, full conscription, but some basic training, uh, I think, would be, uh, it would be to the country's benefit that people do actually know what, what to do uh, if they ever did find that they were faced with a fallout, which mercifully we haven't been for many years. And I've heard lunatics suggest that we shouldn't be spending money on defence and it should go to the NHS instead. Do you think that some in this country, perhaps even in Parliament, have lost touch with the importance of a well-funded, well-equipped armed forces? I do not understand why people don't realise that defence is the first and most important social security. Because if your country is not adequately defended, then your NHS is not defended, your social mm. security system is not defended. Defence is the first and most important national security that you can have. And without that, forget all the other things. And what's a sensible proportion of national income to spend on defence, do you think? Well, I would have been uh, quite happy with 3% um, until we just let ourselves decline as far as we have. And, and I think the brutal truth is um, that in addition to our contribution to NATO, we're going to have to up our own individual spending if we want to get our forces on a sensible level. And by that, I mean all our forces, not forgetting the Navy, which has been very badly run down. Now, Anne, I hope you don't mind me springing this on you, but I've got no doubt you read all the Sunday papers this morning, and the former Labour Foreign Secretary, David Miliband, has said that Brexit has made the UK a lower-status nation. He argues that Britain has lost its influence since Brexit to become just one of many middle powers in the world. Do you agree? No. I mean, first of all, how does he square that with the trade deals we've done, particularly with the Pacific one? Uh, which is worth an, an awful lot of money globally. How does he square that with that? Uh, how does he square it with the big success that we had uh, with the vaccinations when we were taking our own decisions? But I'll tell you something. Uh, I do agree with him uh, that we, uh, we are going backwards for one very simple reason. We're making no use at all of Brexit. We're not actually implementing the Brexit freedoms. Instead, we're shadowing the EU. So raising corporation tax to the level of France, for example, well, what's that going to do for investment in Britain? Keeping umpteen thousands and thousands of EU regulations which we don't need, what's that doing for us? If we had somebody in power, a party in power that was absolutely determined to maximise Brexit to Britain's advantage, we would be laughing. And last but not least, faith schools in England would no longer have to offer, offer a proportion of their places to children who do not follow their religion under plans being considered by number 10. So what this means potentially is that children with no religion 
being kept out of faith schools. So you might not get into a Catholic school if you're not Catholic, Church of England, etc. Is this the right move to freeze out non-religious children from faith schools? Well, it makes perfect common sense for me that if you've set up a Catholic school or if you've set up an Anglican school or a Muslim school or a Jewish school, you've done that for the purposes of meeting the demands of parents who want their children brought up in whatever faith it is. And to force such schools to turn down children of that faith and take instead children of other or no faiths, what is the point of that? There is no point, except that people these days uh, do not respect faith and they don't respect faith schools and they don't respect rigorous teaching of faith. And brilliant stuff as ever. Have a great week and we'll see you next Sunday. My thanks to the brilliant Anne Whittacombe. Fascinating debate. Your reaction to what Anne had to say, Mark, at gbnews.com. Coming up next, tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction from our top pundits. See you in two. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office. We hold on to rather unsettled weather across the UK during the week ahead. Further spells of rain in most areas and often quite windy too. Storm Kathleen starting to move away towards the north and uh, northeast of the UK now, but notice low pressure gathering once again towards the southwest, and it's this that will bring further wet and windy weather over the next couple of days. Back to the detail for this evening and overnight, and it's a fairly quiet picture for many areas, at least for a time, because notice there's uh, more wet weather coming in across the southwest of the UK into parts of Wales, and the very blustery showers we've seen recently up towards the northwest will gradually ease into the early hours. Temperatures dipping down to mid-single figures towards the north under the clearest spells overnight, but uh, starting to rise tonight as the cloud and rain comes up from the south and southwest. There'll be some bright weather around tomorrow across some of the eastern areas during the morning, but a showery burst of rain already gathering down towards the south and southwest, becoming more widespread across England and Wales into the afternoon, and some of those turning quite heavy. Northern Ireland, after a bright start, will see some rain in the afternoon, so it's Scotland that's set to see the best of the weather, here plenty of sunshine and feeling pleasant enough in light winds, with temperatures up to about 12 degrees. Tuesday looks like being a very unsettled day across all areas. We have warnings in force for wind and rain, wettest weather, they're likely towards the northeast of the UK, and the windiest conditions generally down towards the south and southwest. But wherever you are, a pretty blustery and wet day to come, and it stays quite unsettled during the week ahead, perhaps a bit warmer and a bit drier come Thursday. But generally speaking, very unsettled. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live, here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live, here on GB News, Britain's election channel. It's 10.30 and time for tomorrow's Front Pages. Uh, I do like to keep director Ran on his toes. Now, the Daily Telegraph. Cameron warns US over Kiev aid block. NHS loophole allows puberty blockers for children. Hidden cost of Labour's care plans revealed and shamed post office boss silent on scandal. Paula Venels, the former post office chief, refused to answer questions about whether she had knowingly lied to MPs over the Horizon scandal. Uh, next up, The Guardian Care has taken to court over heart-rending minor errors. 
I am a little tired, British athlete, first to run the full length of Africa and disappeared anguish over in Gaza over missing thousands. Daily Mail now. Uh, Rainer's making a fool of you, Keir. Scandal over deputies' home is corrosive to your reputation, Tory chairman, chairman tells Starmer. Keir Starmer and Angela Rayner were tonight accused of breaking their pledge to uphold standards in public life. Tory party chairman Richard Holden said that the Labour leader's unwillingness to probe claims against his deputy over her property dealings was damning. Well, that, of course, was the topic of my Take at 10. And I'm delighted to say that our excellent digital producer, Nick, has crafted it into a video, which I think you can catch on Twitter right now, if not very shortly. Daily Express. Exposed care home crisis putting Britain to shame. The appalling way that Britain treats its most vulnerable and frail citizens in expensive care homes has been laid bare. Devastating figures show residents languish within substandard and inadequate facilities at one in five sites. The Sun, an investigation of the Sun newspaper, deadly ops on sale in UK hotels. Brits are being pressured into signing up for potentially deadly cosmetic surgery in medical roadshows at UK hotels. Uh, Metro now, payback time. What payback time? Punishment isn't working. Thousands of criminals ordered to do unpaid work, such as cleaning graffiti. Get away without finishing it, new data shows. Official Ministry of Justice figures reveal nearly 280,000 hours of punishment were written off last year, the equivalent of 30 years of work. The I newspaper sign non-disclosure agreements to see charges new build owners told. Homeowners are being told they must sign NDAs if they want to see the details of their rising estate charges. And last but not least, the Daily Star. And uh, Esther reveals all. Sausage Dodgy, uh, the brilliant Esther Ranson, says that the TV dog who growled at sausages was, in fact, a fake. The owner got the sound by squeezing his throat. There you go. Well, let's see if it works on me. Sausages. There you go. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Dame Esther, for that uh, insight and for that scoop. Uh, time to introduce my top pundits this evening. Ringside action. I'm delighted to welcome former top advisor to Boris Johnson, Lord Culvier Ranger, journalist and communications advisor Linda Jubilee, and author and campaigner for children in care Chris Wilde. Well, folks, great to have you with me. Uh, let's sink our teeth into some of these big yeah. stories if we can. And this one's a shocker, Chris. Yeah. Exposed care home crisis putting Britain to shame. Uh, one in, yes. uh, I think it was one in four, no, one in five, one in five. sites yeah. Uh, yeah. where residents are languishing in substandard and inadequate facilities. Yeah. Uh, these are the grandmas, grandpas, uncles and aunties that we cherish so much. It's incredibly sad, Mark, and it's the same with the care sector for young people. When it was privatised many years ago, yeah. it, it becomes a money-making mechanism where the people who own these care homes are taking all the money, they don't invest back into them. Some of them are dilapidated, and it's, it's heartbreaking. I know there was a famous story in Yorkshire recently where some care homes, you know, there were no food, it, it was covered in damp. And, and it really is heartbreaking, but our most vulnerable people in this society are subjected to this kind of abuse, Mark. It really I is. Know. And I think we need more restricted um, CQC regulations to make sure that private companies are investing in these and, and not neglecting the people living in them. Most definitely. And, uh, of course, we've got here in The Telegraph a sort of similar story, and it's hidden cost of Labour's care plans revealed, because a lot of this is about budgeting, isn't it, Linda Jubilee? The care sector is a mess. It, it, I, I, I'm not sure because I don't work in the care sector. I haven't analysed it enough. I don't know that it's in a mess, but it's mm. under a lot of pressure. Mm. And the point is that successive governments, not just uh, this government, but previous administrations, simply haven't had a long-term approach to how we deal with our elderly population. I know it's terrible because, we, we, you know, many years ago people retired at 60, died at 65, now they're living an extra 30 years. There's a huge amount of pressure because of that rise in the so-called grey population. Mm. But at the end of the day, people are having to sell their homes to pay for their care and that can't be right. And the care that's happening is often substandard, Colvia. I think, you know, both Lynn and Chris are right. There, there's a... There's a cumulative effect here that mm. we've known about for mm. decades, mm -hmm. that we have an yeah. ageing population, that adult social care, the costs of it, that the care, carers who are unpaid, 
the, oh, the unpaid yeah. ones. And, and my father was one and for a number of years. And we've and probably mine. all got family and friends yeah. who've done this. Yeah. Yes. And we worry about our parents and everything else. And we need to look at this. And this, I don't think this should become a political football for... Oh, the political it's parties. too important. It, it is, and it's a bit like the NHS. There is a problem to be solved in the NHS. There's a problem to be solved in adult social care. Yeah. And this it will be a big debate when it comes to the general election later in the I year. I think so, Because yeah. we'll yeah. be looking for real answers. And when we were talking about earlier, who do people want to vote for? Yeah. I don't think it's going to matter about Angela Rayner's tax bill and this other. It's going to be matter well, which gov which party mm -hmm. put some sensible policies on the table. Yeah, and these are policy winners. These, these are real things what real yeah. people want to know about. People, people in the community. On them. Yeah, people of will vote yeah. on the party they believe will deal with these issues. Well, what about Labour then? Because in the Telegraph, hidden cost of Labour's care plans revealed. Uh, Labour's plan to hand trade unions greater powers to negotiate social care pay is expected to cost billions of pounds despite the policy being given no funding. Now, so Keir Starmer is committed to establishing a fair pay agreement in the sector. Um, and this sounds to me like trouble is brewing for the next Labour yeah, government, think, Linda. Oh, I think it is. But no one's under any... Um, a, a delusion. Delusion yeah. over this. That, that, that next, whoever gets in, and it probably will be Labour, will face a really, really tough time in every sector, but particularly this one, I suspect. The care, the care sector in particular for both adults and for young people. It's so expensive. It's diabolical, yeah. yeah, so, yeah. so hard well, to find. Now, listen, don't we need to have an honest conversation with the public about this, Colvier, that we're going to have to pay higher taxes to accommodate these care needs. This is something that Theresa May flirted with in her notorious manifesto, which caused her to lose David Cameron's mm. majority, of course. Mm. She was honest with the public. They didn't like the message. I, I, I won't agree with that fully, Mark, because I think there was a problem with the campaign there, not just that message. Mm. There were a number of things that weren't quite clear to the public as we went through a short, sharp campaign mm. that took the wind out of the sails of that election. And but there was, was the dementia but tax element to the, the manifesto, the, which was damaging, wasn't there it? Was, there was. And you're right, people do have to have a clear conversation, but I don't want to hear about the cost and the money uh, without understanding what are the, the outcomes. Results, yeah. I want yeah. to hear the parties <laughs> talking about what are the solutions? How are we going to deal with this, with this crisis? What services are going to be delivered at that price? I mean, Not just that we're going to increase yeah. the cost yeah. burden and therefore we're going to increase taxes, taxation. I think the, the British public are not fools. Yeah. They want to see better yeah. Outcomes and services and until, delivered, and, and, and we will we will pay for those and until, if they are delivered. Until you hit this problem, like you did with your father, not that it's a problem, and it's your parents, so it's a challenge, I guess. You don't realise how many thousands of pounds it costs every month to pay for your parents' care. No, my, my father looked after my grandfather, who's passed away now, for almost ten years. Yeah. Uh, and and it was quite a you know it was a full time a full time job. job. He wasn't paid for that, but but that's but you that's go to a chance. care home and yes. it can be six seven thousand yeah, pounds yeah. It, per it, month. Exactly right. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, Chris Wilde, payback yeah. time. What payback time? Punishment isn't working. Uh, this is in the metro. Thousands yeah. of criminals ordered to to do unpaid work such as cleaning graffiti, get away without finishing it. Uh, they've written off. 280,000 hours of punishment last year alone. Yeah, it's... Do, do you know what? I, with stuff like this, rehabilitation, I go into a lot of jails. I work with a lot of these young men as well who will yeah. get these kind of community orders. It doesn't work. You know, I want to see these people getting back into working programmes, you know, paying taxes, investing back into the economy. Mm. Doing stuff like this, it doesn't work. Then they're, they're not going to be held accountable if they don't do it. There's no kind of huge ramifications if they don't turn up for community service. Uh, but sometimes it works. Chris, sometimes because, because it works. We, we implemented when we were at City Hall yeah. on people who are fare evading on the underground um, and earn your travel mm. back soon for mm. kids. Do you think and, getting community service is going to yeah. stop them from doing it again? Well, is, I think it, it, is, well, it, it, is that punishment? Because they, they had, they had, <laughs> they had, they had yeah. travel that got taken away right. and then they'd have to pay for their travel because they were being antisocial. And, and they did learn less. I think it's about how it's delivered. That's You've right. got to be robust. You've mm. got yeah. to be able to And say, constructive well, as well. Yes, exactly. Constructive is the key word. I think word. sometimes yeah. we lose that yeah. sort of robustness, the mm. discipline of what's going on, and it starts to, you know, ebb away. And then it becomes ineffectual. So I think... I think it can work, but it needs to be delivered with strength and discipline. Yeah. Uh, speaking of strength and discipline, uh, a smaller story in The Telegraph. Uh, Gen Z puts elbows back on the table. Elbows are making their way back onto the dinner table as youngsters believe that manners are no longer relevant. Some 60% of those in Generation Z who were polled believe that traditional table manners are no longer relevant. 
Um, <laughs> what, what do you think about this? You've got a couple of kids, I've haven't you? Got a couple of kids. <laughs> no, I, uh, uh, full disclosure: the five-year-old and three-year-old three boys, who I spend ninety percent of my time saying, "What do you say?" Please, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> I'm waiting for the magic yeah. word. What's the magic word, Daddy? Yeah. Please. Just <laughs> as we used to say, uh, yeah, as yeah, we used that to, as we used to say in my family, you ship your oars. Oh, wow. That's you what do what you with your oars? Ship ship your family show, oars. Linda. We've all had a drink. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. what you don't like. It's not up like oh, this. I it's see. not down like that. You carefully eat. Um, I remember a, a local headmistress in Richmond Park telling me, and this is a very exclusive school, very expensive school, told me she was completely horrified by five-year-olds turning up and eating their lunch with their fingers. Yep. And now, I appreciate that it's sometimes possible to do that in some cultures and sometimes it's, it's possible to do that yeah. with some food. But you need to teach children uh, table manners. I just appreciate my kids eating because it's so difficult. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and they have some bad habits. And I'm not proud to say yeah. this, but sometimes with my boy in particular, he's two, it, it, to get him to eat, I've got to put his computer there with the yes. tea. And it's yes. hard. So These I'll, are bad I'll habits. Up to that one but he's only two. But, but, yeah. This, yeah, it, it, but there is an element of you know what we can do as parents. And yeah. you've done it with your yeah, grown I up certainly kids have. now. You've got fine three kids you were yeah. talking about and all, all achieved great things. So we, you know, as parents, can we set a bit of a benchmark? Yeah. But there is some manners maketh the person, and etc. Et are standards slipping though? Are, 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 are oh, you know, yes. teenagers, youngsters, are they less polite? Are, do they have fewer manners? I think the, the Queen said that the most important yeah. thing to teach children is manners. The late Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. That was a great priority for her. I just wonder. I mean, you see kids going to school in sliders now, essentially flip flops, not oh, properly dressed. Dear me. But, but can theory, I just, theory, just on that, theory. I've got a girl, 10-year-old girl who's turned into a teenager and, and it's, it's, it's different. But for me, I think the most basic and the most important, uh, uh, like you said, please and thank you, and having respect for everybody, I think those are the most essential kind of manners. But is, it being manners. Still, is it still being taught or is it, I, has it been I allowed so. to slide? I think so. Yeah. I come from a very working class family and I always said please and thank you. We always had dinner at the dinner but table. do the next generation do the same? Well, they're doing my house, that's for sure. Yeah, I'm <laughs> glad to hear it. Then yeah. apologise and say yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah man, that's made for the man. Yeah. Well, what about this, Linda? Uh, Sun investigation, deadly ops on sale in UK hotels. Yes. Brits are being pressured that's into mental. signing up for potentially deadly cosmetic surgery in medical roadshows at UK hotels. I've got to say, I wouldn't mind a bum lift in a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> you really don't want one. That's one of the most dangerous operations yeah. you can have, and I know about this. Well, they'd have to find my bum first. <laughs> <laughs> but I did this story years ago for um, for ITV's Tonight programme, where I flew to Florida. Oh, with uh, Trevor McDonald's? Yeah, where, uh, where, where they were actually... The reason I went is because they were operating on women in, in people on people's kitchen tables. They weren't going to a hotel, they Remarkable. were going to their homes. And it was the Brazilian bum lift, because all the plastic surgeons who developed the expertise were in South America, where they have a beach culture. And they'd all come up to Florida, and they were all operating. They were cowboy cosmetic surgeons. And it was causing so many injuries and at least a few deaths even before we got there. My goodness uh, gracious. As someone who cowers at the sight of even a, a, you a needle... You wouldn't do it, would you? <laughs> I can't go anywhere near any... Just the sound I, of... I, I just think now it's just operation. so affordable as well, though. You think now it's like it's it's as common as going to the dentist, going to yeah. have Botox on really the face. It's terrible. It's, it's horrible. Yeah. It's a shocker, an absolute yeah. shocker. Uh, well, listen, folks, we've got uh, more from tomorrow's newspaper front pages, uh, including... Uh, the first sighting of the lesser spotted chief of the post office, Paula Venels, and also a shocking story about uh, Britain becoming the couch potato nation of the world. And we've been conducting an exclusive Mark Dolan tonight people's poll. I've been asking, is David Miliband right, that Brexit has made the UK a lower status nation? Well, the results are in. I shall reveal all next. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. It's the first time we've had an admission from someone who at least used to be very senior yep. in the party, saying that this election is not about winning, really, for the Conservatives now, it's about mitigating the losses. There is broad recognition that this election has already been lost and that it's about damage limitation. And it is really important because it's the difference between whether, if, you know, if Labour win a slim majority, then the fight is on for the next election. I know it seems silly to look five years ahead, but it does make a difference, mm. versus 
basically accepting that we have 10 years of Labour government ahead. Having an acknowledgement that the Tories are going to lose and lose badly, mm. um, disastrously maybe, um, having that acknowledgement coming from somebody so senior is very demoralising for everybody else in the party, but also doesn't it make it then look rather immoral for them to just drag on right through to maybe November? Personally, I think Rishi Sunak should name the date now. I think he should name it for October or November. In terms of reform, if they're only four points behind the Conservatives in the latest poll, do we need to stop the narrative, which we have been using legitimately, saying, well, they're, they're, yeah, they're doing all right in the polls, but they won't win any seats? Do we need to change that perspective now? I think it's really difficult to say. It depends on reform's electoral strategy. There's a lot of evidence that in certain parts of the country with certain demographics, they do have a really good chance. So I think if they target seats in the red wall and other places where there's big disillusionment with the Conservatives and what they'd promised, I can't imagine that reform are at the stage where they could take uh, masses of seats. It's more about that portion of the vote that they'll be taking away that I think is going to result in that massive Labour landslide. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Now, we've been conducting an exclusive Mark Dolan tonight People's Poll. We've been asking, is David Miliband right that Brexit has made the UK a lower status nation? Well, 16.6% say yes, whilst 83.4% say no. I agree with that group. Uh, let's get reaction to all of tomorrow's big stories with uh, former advisor to Boris Johnson, Lord Colvia Ranger, journalist and communications advisor, Linda Jubilee, and author and campaigner for children in care, Chris Wilde. And Maria, you've got some front pages for me. Let's have a look at what we've got. Start with the Times newspaper now, and we shall go for this. Uh, rise of the 24-hour wait for a bed in A&E. And I think that's, and I think that's uh, us. And how about this story in uh, The Telegraph? Uh, Britain's new flexible working rules risk turning the country into a couch potato nation. Uh, new measures introduced over the weekend mean that employees have the right to ask for flexible working from their first day in a new job. This could include requests for remote working, staggered hours or job sharing. Are you having this call, Veer? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know, we've got to do... The, we've got to get people back into the yeah. habit of being in the office, being able to continue yes. to work. Yes. Yeah, I think yeah. job sharing works. I think that, that the yeah. flexibility, yeah. Yeah. and that's quite a, a good innovation to have. Uh, also, that has to be done with some real discipline. I've seen it yeah. work really yeah. well where people are quite committed to it. But it's got to be in a structure. It's got to be in a way that's really well management. And that's where management then matters. Yeah. And sometimes those things just fall over. And yes. You, and you don't get the outcomes. Well, and we, then it's the poor people right. who need that service that don't get the service. We saw uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg when he was, yes. uh, I think, a business secretary or, or was Going the head of the House of... Uh, the, the leader of the House of Commons. But anyway, he was in the Cabinet and, and he went round his department... Sorry, I missed you. ...polite notes. Sorry, I missed you. <laughs> Sorry, I missed you. Coaxing people back into the office. Yeah. Uh, you've got the Office for National Statistics. Uh, some of their staff, right. I think over 1,000, uh, threatening to strike over being asked to come in for two days a week. Wow. Look, uh, all jobs are mm. different. But we do know, and I've worked in corporate life for 25 years, mm. I, I understand the office environment. Uh, and what I talked about when I was in corporate life is good corporate citizenship. 
you learn from other people, younger people especially, mm. traits, management styles, mm -hmm. culture. Yeah. That happens through people coming together. You can have it reduced, you can have people, some jobs can be done in a certain time at home, yeah. but there must be a core element uh, not must be, but for most office-based jobs that people come together, working as teams, yeah. building yeah. respect for each other. And I think all of that happens as people come to it. We're naturally social you want to be beings. Social. And you yeah, want to be no, travelling no, no, no. to and from the office, you know, building up your 10,000 steps a day. You want to be meeting people in the office to try and reduce any bad effects on your mental well-being. You yeah. need to be communing with other people. You don't need to be doing it full-time, but, but if you can have flexible work, and I think that's a good idea where you're in their office at least three days a week. I've got an incredible laugh story, but before we do that, a couple of emails to catch up on. Uh, on social care, Barbara says, uh, Mark, I was an unpaid 24-7 carer for 25 years after retiring and have a wealth of experience and advice in this field. Could I find anyone who was interested? They're terrified to touch it, and I knew mm -hmm. how to keep mm -hmm. someone out of a care home, and I think that's maybe the key thing. Is about making sure people are healthier. Uh, regarding Angela Rayner, Paul has said, Hi, Mark, let's imagine it was Pretty Patel or Liz Truss or Suella Bravman. Rayner would be touring the TV studios demanding their immediate resignation. No ifs, no buts. Just resign would be her mantra. Uh, what about schools, religious schools, uh, not accepting non-religious children? Uh, this from Victoria who's in Lancaster, which is a beautiful city. Victoria says, Hi, Mark, I'm a pagan of the old religion and a very small minority religion in the UK. I attended a Catholic school because legally they couldn't stop anyone going to their school. 70% uh, of the students were Muslims. So there was one Hindu. Uh, where would I go if schools didn't have to take everyone? How far would kids be expected to travel? I think that's a really fair point. Thank you for that. Uh, Anne Widdicombe talks about funding for our armed forces being the most important thing. Um, but a country the size of the UK should have minimal protection. Our nuclear deterrent is sufficient, says Chris. Um, and uh, what about this from Lynn? Last word on Angela Rayner. You can tell she's lying. Her lips are moving. Oh it's obviously a trait that's required to be in government <laughs> these days. Lynn, thank you for that. A couple of words on The Times. Rise of the 24-hour wait for a bed, an A and E. Imagine, 24 hours yeah. in A and E, yeah. welcome yeah. to hell. Yeah, scandalous. Yeah. My little girl was sick the other day, uh, we called 111. They said, I said, can I get a doctor's appointment? No, go to A and E. I said, I won't do that. I'm not going to risk sitting in the A and E yeah. for 12 to 24 hours with a 10 year old girl. It's scandalous. Uh, it's just, it's, yeah, lost for words on this. And well, I indeed. And uh, Linda, it's the most. Uh, what can I say? Visible metric of, of the challenges facing the NHS is the length of A&E times. Yeah, I know. And I do a lot of work uh, with our emergency services, doing their media awareness and media yeah. um, coaching, if you like. So, so I hear things in the front line and the situation is really, really dire with, with ambulances lining up outside the wow. hospitals, unable to offload patients even into the bed that w or, or to a chair where they've got to wait. They can't get them out of the ambulances. Well, listen, I've had a brilliant idea. <laughs> Let's have another lockdown to save the NHS. <laughs> Who's in? Definitely only kidding. Uh, can I thank my fantastic pundits tonight? Kulveer, Chris and Linda, absolute dream team, my A team. I'm back on Saturday, uh, no, Friday at 8 o'clock, Friday at 8. But uh, can I just say that the production team comprises two people on Mark Dolan tonight today, and it's Katie and Maria. They smashed it, so thanks for doing a great job. Yeah. I can't yep. do anything without you watching and listening <laughs> at home. I'll catch you on Saturday and Friday and Sunday. Headliners is next. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office. We hold on to rather unsettled weather across the UK during the week ahead. Further spells of rain in most areas and often quite windy too. Storm Kathleen starting to move away towards the north and uh, northeast of the UK now, but notice low pressure gathering once again towards the southwest, and it's this that will bring further wet and windy weather over the next couple of days. Back to the detail for this evening and overnight, and it's a fairly quiet picture for many areas, at least for a time, because notice there's uh, more wet weather coming in across the southwest of the UK into parts of Wales, and the very blustery showers we've seen recently up towards the northwest will gradually ease into the early hours. Temperatures dipping down to mid single figures towards the north under the clearest spells overnight, but uh, starting to rise tonight as the cloud and rain comes up from the south and southwest. There'll be some bright weather around tomorrow across some of the eastern areas during the morning, but a showery burst of rain already gathering down towards the south and southwest, becoming more widespread across England and Wales into the afternoon, and some of those turning quite heavy. 
Northern Ireland after a bright start will see some rain in the afternoon, so it's Scotland that's set to see the best of the weather, here plenty of sunshine and feeling pleasant enough in light winds with temperatures up to about 12 degrees. Tuesday looks like being a very unsettled day across all areas. We have warnings in force for wind and rain, wettest weather, they're likely towards the northeast of the UK and the windiest conditions generally down towards the south and southwest. But wherever you are, a pretty blustery and wet day to come and it stays quite unsettled during the week ahead, perhaps a bit warmer and a bit drier come Thursday. But generally speaking, very unsettled. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. You can win our biggest prize giveaway so far. First, there's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7pm. Scotland's new hate crime law, which comes into effect on April Fool's Day, criminalises threatening or abusive or insulting behaviour, which is intended to stir up hatred against people based on age, disability, religion, sexual orientation and transgender identity. The act has proved controversial. The head of uh, complaints at the police watchdog says it could have a chilling effect on freedom of speech. But the bill's defenders say it is nowhere near as draconian as is being suggested and uh, protecting people from hate is long overdue. So joining me to discuss this, the Alba MP for Kakaldi, uh, Neil Hanvey. Welcome to the show, Neil. Uh, now, Hamza Youssef has come out and said there's been a lot of disinformation about this. People are overreacting. Uh, this bill is absolutely fine. Uh, is he right? Uh, no, well, I, I made a, a bit of a light-hearted comment on his claim that there's disinformation being spread about uh, this legislation uh, by saying he'd misspelled information. Uh, because what's really happening is that people are spreading the truth uh, about this legislation. And it's, you know, nobody is saying that um, hate crime should be uh, given a green light. Uh, but the, the the way that this bill has been, or this act, has been constructed uh, is deliberately intended to prevent um, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, uh, freedom of belief. There are certain uh, elements that are excluded from the bill, particularly around gender cri critical beliefs, and most importantly, um, sex as a, a as a class. So, women's sex based rights are not covered by this bill. Uh, sex. The, the bill is silent on the definition of sex, and therefore, same sex attraction is effectively meaningless, uh, and it really has a chilling effect on political discourse. Good evening. The top stories from the GB newsroom. Thousands of Israelis are gathering in Jerusalem, calling for the release of hostages still being held by Hamas. In Tel Aviv, candles were lit for the hostages. It comes as today marks six months since the terror attack on October 7th. Families of hostages also joined a rally in London to call for their release, saying the six months after the attack have been hell. Also marking the occasion, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has said the government continues to stand by Israel's right to defend its security and added the UK is shocked by the bloodshed and called for an immediate humanitarian pause in fighting. He also urged Hamas to release its hostages and implored Israel to get aid into Gaza more swiftly. 
Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary has used the occasion to stress that the UK's support for Israel is not unconditional. Writing in the Sunday Times, Lord Cameron said there's no doubt where the blame lies over the death of three British aid workers and added this must never happen again. John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby died in airstrikes carried out by the IDF on the 1st of April. The Deputy Prime Minister has denied claims that the UK is failing to prepare for war. Oliver Dalton is defending the government after outgoing Armed Forces Minister James Heapy told The Telegraph only Ministry of Defence officials attended a war crime preparation exercise which was meant for the whole of government. Former Defence Secretary Ben Wallace has backed him up, saying too many in government are just hoping everything goes away. Police have named a man they're searching for after a woman was stabbed to death in broad daylight in Bradford city centre. West Yorkshire police detectives say they want to trace 25-year-old Habiba Masoom, who's from the Oldham area. They were called to the city centre yesterday afternoon following reports of an attack by a man who fled the scene. The woman was taken to hospital where she died. And a British man nicknamed Hardest Geezer has become the first person to run the length of Africa. Russell Cook from Worthing and West Sussex crossed the finish line in Tunisia today. He ran through 16 countries in 352 days. The 27-year-old said he'd struggled with his mental health, gambling and drinking. And he said he wanted to make a difference. And he's raised over £600,000 for charity. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's over to Headliners. Hello and welcome to Headliners, your first look at tomorrow's papers with the help of top comedians. I'm Stephen Allen, joined by Brains and Beauty tonight. We have Cressida Wetton and Paul Cox, who I didn't write an intro for. <laughs> <laughs> you <both> nice. <laughs> All the better for that. I to say, you'll enjoy that one. Let's cross over to Paul. How are you doing? <laughs> but when he, even when he said it, I thought... He hasn't mentioned anything about me. <laughs> so there's, thank you, there's two other intros later on which you won't enjoy either. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. I bet you are. Splendid. Well, let's crack on and take a look at Monday's front pages. We can start with the Daily Mail, says Rainer's making a fool of you, Keir. Uh, there's The Guardian with carers taken to court over heart-rending minor errors. The Telegraph, Cameron warns US over Kiev aid block. The Financial Times says Biden poised to warn Beijing against aggressive tactics in South China Sea. The I front page is sign NDA to see charges new build owners told. More on that in a bit. Uh, the Daily Star sausage dodgy. And those were your front pages. <laughs> right, Cressida, what's the Telegraph treating us with? going with Cameron warns US over Kyiv aid block. Uh, so, yeah, the US doesn't want to doesn't want to pay a load. They were going to pay $95 billion, which is load. We were going to pay... Uh, <laughs> which two... is load. <laughs> Please! <laughs> we were going to pay £2.5 billion, pounds, which is a tiny fraction. I uh, just thought I'd throw that in. But the point they is... It's smaller. I it mean, is a lot yeah. smaller, but Cameron's yeah. saying, oi, you need to pay up your massive amount that you promised because he thinks it's a threat to the West. If we don't sort Putin out, who's friends with China, don't know if you know that, um, and North Korea... Well, they let Kim Jong-un drive the van or something, don't they? I can't believe he's really... I'm not that worried about North Korea on the road, but anyway, the point <laughs> is all of these other nations who don't like the West yeah. are all making friends, supporting each other, and uh, Cameron thinks we need to do that. Just on the North Korea, though, I used to be the same, thinking, like, yeah, but, you know, they're launching missiles into the sea, they're at war with fish, come on. And then the level of technology when they managed to do the Sony hack, because I presume they all had ZX Spectrums or something. Right. But then when they... So, actually, all of a sudden, yeah, let's not pick on them, just in case... Right. Know, well, they've the got sea. big mates, so that's the point, isn't we it? We do have this sort of complex that we're slightly more grandiose than we are, don't we, over... Particularly in, in the UK, because, you know, we did rule the world... And now we barely rule ourselves. And uh, are you talking Britain down? No, 
I know a bunch of people who are. I'm building it back. That. But we, in comparison, we do, I mean, we talk about them against us, like the West are on the West side. You know, the trouble is we are against ourselves within the West, aren't we? I understand what Cameron's doing here. He's doing what his buddy uh, Boris Johnson would do, and that's rally the troops and say, look, we need to support Ukraine. But it's it cannot be a bottomless pit. And at the moment, it's just this drudgery of war where they're fighting over two metres here and two metres there and no-one's really winning and it's just splurging loads of money. And that lends itself to Russia because, you know, th they live that way anyway. They're happy, to, they're happy to invest all their money into wars rather than into their people. Yeah. If, uh, if Ukraine becomes an area where Putin wins, do you worry about how much money we'd have to spend if things keep heading this way? To be honest, if Russia won and the council tax came down... <laughs> no, that wouldn't... <laughs> <laughs> Is that a possibility, Steve? It's more the idea that, you know, if, if all of a sudden... If NATO... If that somehow happens and NATO gets... No, of forward, course. I mean, I'm being facetious. Then. And it wouldn't be a good look, you know, if Russia...